Welcome to That Annuity Show, the podcast that will make you an expert in explaining annuities to your clients. Give us 30 minutes each week and we'll shave hours from your client presentations. Now, here's your host, Paul Tyler. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of That Annuity Show. Ramsey, good morning. Good morning to you. Always glad to be here. Yeah, it's just the two of us, uh, Will and Mark. Uh, I think Mark's traveling. I, I think I'm actually going to meet him down in Florida for a sales meeting, and Will's on vacation, so uh, it's the two of us. Uh, a topic today is going to be one that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, which is higher safe interest on money. Right? Do you want to do you want to talk about it and introduce our guest? Sure, sure. So look, you know, we all um, we all interact with uh, insurance agents, financial advisors, uh, and every one of them, as part of the advice they give, or as part of sort of the sources of what they are selling, you know, have to have a discussion or understand kind of what the their client's cash position is, and you know, what we're learning is that there are a lot of things that can be done to one help help our clients optimize how they manage their cash and also help us understand how much cash they have. And it really comes down to what are the tools that can help you do that. And um, we're very lucky to have Gary Zimmerman join us today. Jerry's a good friend of mine um, from my days back in New York. And he has built a company called Max My Interest, which is going a long way to improve the tools that are we're creating a, really a game-changing tool that can help uh, advisors and planners uh, you know, uh, achieve, help their clients achieve their goals. So with that, Gary, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, we want to hear about a little bit about you and then how you decided to start Max My Interest. Well, great. Thank you, Ramsey. And thank you, Paul, as well, for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, Max My Interest is kind of an interesting story in the sense that it's really an accidental company. Um, I spent the first 15 years of my career as an investment banker, advising corporations and financial sponsors and sovereign wealth funds on direct investing in M&A. And um, it was really during the financial crisis that the genesis of Max My Interest emerged and, and quite accidentally. So I was working at one of the world's largest banks. That bank, like many, had a near-death experience in March of 2009. And as the bank was on the precipice of failure, it struck me that all of my cash that was sitting at the bank, or at least all of the cash that was above the FDIC limit, left me exposed as an unsecured creditor. In other words, if the bank were to fail, the FDIC would reimburse uh, up to the FDIC limit, which was 250000 but every dollar above that uh, would basically be gone. Um, and when I thought about why I held cash, it was for safety and liquidity. And yet here I was all of a sudden in the midst of the financial crisis uh, where both safety and liquidity were at risk. So I was searching for a better way to manage cash. And uh, the bank, at the time presented one of these brokered deposit solutions. You may have, there are a number of companies that market these, but basically the idea is they take your funds and then they sell it to other banks um, and they promise that you're able to get increased FDIC insurance coverage that way. But I really dug into the details and I really wanted to understand how those systems worked. And the more I studied them, the more concerned I became because while they sounded good on paper, when you actually looked at the details, what was happening behind the scenes is that your money was sort of going into a black box and you had no idea where it was. You didn't know which banks held it. You didn't have same day liquidity. And if the originating financial institution were to fail, you lose access to all of your funds until the FDIC resolution process is complete. So that struck me as not a very good solution. And the simplest thing that I could think of was to open more bank accounts um, for myself directly in my own name at individual banks. And by structuring it that way, I could get increased FDIC insurance coverage, but I would also have full same-day liquidity and I would know where all of my cash was. So to me, that felt safer. And um, so it was a very simple idea. I'm, I'm sure I was not the only person running around opening additional bank accounts during the financial crisis, but I happened to be an expat in Tokyo at the time. And so I couldn't just walk around the corner to Chase or Wells Fargo and open new accounts. And so uh, I went online. And there I found the, um, some of the early online banks. You might remember names like ING Direct or HSBC Direct or Emigrant Direct. And I studied the online banks and they're FDIC and chartered banks just like any other. 
The only difference is they don't have physical branches, but here I was 7,000 miles away anyway, so I didn't care about the physical branch. And what I did is I spent the afternoon opening as many of these online savings accounts as I could and parceling out funds so that they stayed below the FDIC limit at each bank. And that was really my simple solution during the financial crisis. Nothing more complicated than that. Just my own money sitting in my own bank accounts at multiple banks. Um, the, the birth of Max, my interest sort of happened after that when I realized that managing a bunch of separate accounts was a fair bit of work. Um, you know, I would log in every month to check the balances and I would notice that accrued interest had put me over the FDIC limit or I would notice that the interest rates had changed. And I said, well, look, you know, all of these accounts are really the same. They're essentially commodities. So I might as well move funds from one bank to another to get whatever, you know, whatever the highest rate is each month. And for the next three and a half years, every month I logged in, checked the balances, figured out, you know, which funds should move, requested funds transfers. It was really a lot of work. Um, and finally, uh, one day I got sick and tired of doing this and I was about to stop and I looked back and I realized I'd picked up an extra 40K or so of incremental risk-free return. And that struck me. I said, you know, in finance, we're always looking for alpha, right? We're always looking for incremental return without incremental risk. And in fact, in this case, it was incremental return with less risk. And so I didn't want to walk away from that, but I didn't want to spend my Sundays moving funds around either. And so um, I started to think about whether uh, technology could be employed to make this process of managing multiple bank accounts simpler. And that was really the genesis of, of Max My Interest. Um, it didn't really become a company though until I started digging into the numbers. And what I found really shocked me. Um, in the United States, um, if you look just at the top 1% of US households, they were holding about at one and a half trillion dollars in cash and cash equivalents. And if you looked at the top 4%, which was any household with more than a million of net worth, they were holding about three and a half trillion. Um, that was back in 2013. Today, that figure is 4.8 trillion. So roughly half of the nation's cash is held by 4% of US households. Now that figure is not surprising. Um, but what was shocking to me is that almost all of that cash is sitting in the wrong place, where it is simultaneously under earning and underinsured. And so the idea behind Max My Interest was really simple, which is let's make it easy for people to pick up incremental yield and incremental FDIC insurance coverage without having to switch banks. And thus Max My Interest was born. So as you as you created this idea and you know who have you pursued as your your target audience like what's the vector to get to the end consumer do you go to consumers directly or is this more of a business to business approach it's a great question ramsey we actually don't market direct to consumer um, we do have a public facing website so um, we have grown through earned media we've been featured in the economist and the wall street journal and uh, we were on um, mad money with jim kramer which was fun um, but most of our growth has actually come through financial advisors. And that was actually somewhat of an accident as well. Um, we started to see uh, visitors to the website reaching out to their advisors saying, you know, hey, Ramsey, should I use Max? And Ramsey would say, I don't know, I've never heard of Max. And that was sort of the end of the conversation. And so we decided that it would make sense to start engaging with financial advisors just to share with them what we had built and see what they thought. We weren't selling anything to them. We don't make any money from financial advisors. But um, we went to our first advisor conference and we set up a tiny little booth. It was probably the most pathetic looking booth you've ever seen because we weren't there to sell anything. We just wanted to spend time with advisors and understand um, what they were thinking about and whether this solution had relevance to them. And um, interestingly, one of the organizers of the conference came by and she said, you know, who are you? Why do you have such a sad looking booth and what do you do? Um, and we explained it and she said, this is the best thing I've, I've seen in 30 years. And she grabbed our little brochures and she ran around handing them out. And so the rest of the conference, we were five advisors deep the whole time. And as we explained Max My Interest and what we were doing, we got the same two reactions almost uniformly across all the advisors. The first was, as a fiduciary, now that I've heard about this, I can't not use it. So that made us feel really good. But, but the second reaction was actually even more insightful. And the advisor said, well, gee, this makes all the sense in the world 
but my typical client portfolio is only 3% in cash, so why do I care? And that was really interesting to us because all the research we had done showed that the average high net worth household in North America was holding 23% of their assets in cash. So it begged the question, where's the other 20%? And what we found is the other 20% is sitting in an account at Wells or Chase or Morgan Stanley or, or somewhere where it's really not earning much of anything. Um, in fact, today it's probably earning zero or maybe one basis point, one one hundredth of a percent. Um, and so uh, what we realized is that what we had inadvertently built was actually an asset discovery tool. That if the advisor could provide a better solution to clients on cash, the client would bring into view um, a lot of cash that the advisor wasn't even aware of in the first place. And that in turn could prompt better, more holistic discussions with the advisor around planning and asset allocation. Why are you holding so much more money? You know, are you more risk averse than I thought? Are you saving for something? Are you concerned about something? Um, and the reality is, is that there are a lot of, of, of other asset classes, annuities included, that can provide a much better return than cash, right? So our objective as a company was never to get people to hold cash. They hold cash anyway. It's really to make sure that they're holding the right amount of cash and that they're earning and, and maximizing return not only on the cash, but also on other asset classes as well. Um, and so that's really how we started to grow, uh, was that advisor said, well, wait a minute, this is a great tool for my clients. It's something they've never heard of. It makes me look smart. Um, it provides a better result for the client, and it enables me to engage in better, more holistic discussions with my client about planning and asset allocation um, and other investment opportunities. Now, I, I love your description of your product as an asset discovery tool because it kind of begs the other question, well, I'm an advisor, Gary. How much do I get for bringing my client to you? The answer is nothing, right? The answer is nothing. Uh, we, don't, we don't pay uh, advisors directly. Um, in fact, you know, it, it's a very lean product and we've worked very hard to keep the cost structure very low so that the pricing to the client is very low. So um, we charge eight basis points a year to the client. That's two basis points per quarter. It's roughly half as much as a typical money market fund. Yet today, the average government money market fund yields two basis points. The top rate on the max platform is 60 basis points. Um, so there's a very big yield differential. And the, the real focus was provide um, you know, a, a fiduciary compliant solution to clients where it's very clear that the client is better off. And the advisor is also better off, not because they're paid for distribution, but because the provision of greater visibility into the client's total cash balances um, can lead to growth in AUM. Because a lot of that cash today that is discovered through the Max platform is not the cash that's in the brokerage account or the portfolio, it's cash that's sitting at Wells Fargo. And we routinely um, see clients come and join Max and they'll link their existing account at Wells Fargo and it's sitting with a million dollars of cash earning, you know, two basis points in a platinum savings account. Um, and we know that we can do much better than that on cash, but it also begs the question, does the client really need to hold that much cash or um, was that really just inertia? Um, and if, you know, even half of that cash can be migrated into equities or fixed income or an annuity, then the advisor um, can earn higher returns, the client can earn higher returns, and everyone is better off, um, maybe except for Wells Fargo. Okay. So, Ramsey, i got to jump in one more question before you, you, you dive in here, which is, I'm thinking, market opportunity. Like you say, $4 trillion is sitting in cash. It's all high net worth people who should be very educated. You know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, you know, my, <laughs> I've got a lot of money sitting in cash that should not be sitting in cash. Um, um, you know, shame on me. W what's, the, what's the sort of safe yield? Now, you know, if all the money migrated somewhere else, it would change the economy. I get it. But how much money is out there waiting? to be uh, earned, say, in the next year by just being smarter with the cash uh, that, that people have sitting in, the four tr in their $4 trillion worth of accounts? Paul, it's tens of billions of dollars uh, of interest income that individual investors are foregoing simply because they're either not aware of the opportunity to earn more or they can't get around to doing something about it. And you know, it's really interesting because 
in the early days of Max, people said, well, who's your competitor? And they were expecting me to name another company. And I said, no, our, our competitors are, are, are really simple. It's awareness, apathy, and inertia, right? Awareness is, I don't know that I could be earning higher yield on my cash. In fact, we found heads of major brokerage firms who have no idea that this sort of yield is available. Um, so awareness is a really important one. And that's where you know things like your show can be really helpful um, in educating people and making them aware um, uh, of these broader opportunities. The second one is apathy, which says, I know I could be earning more, but I just don't care. Now that's kind of a silly statement, right? I mean, if I came to you with two S&P 500 index funds and one had 20 basis points of fees and one had 50 basis points of fees, you'd probably pick the one with 20 basis points of fees because you know that compounded over time, that extra 30 basis points is going to make a difference. And the same is true of cash. But we've all been conditioned to think of cash as a zero return asset class, right? And if most banks have paid zero for so long that people just assume they're not entitled to return on cash, but that's kind of nonsense. Um, so getting over apathy is, is a really important friction. And then the final one is inertia, which says, okay, now I'm aware that I could be earning more. Um, and I would like to do something about it, but it's just not the highest thing on my to-do list. Uh, and that's a very real force, right? Inertia is actually a very powerful force across all the financial services. And so what we did was focus on how do we make the enrollment process as fast and as simple as possible? And when we started, um, you know, if you go back five years ago, it would have taken you an hour and a half over three days to get set up with Max. Well, that was too much friction, right? Um, even though it might have meant tens of thousands of dollars of incremental return for our clients, uh, you know, per person, it was still too much effort. And so we had this dream that someday we would get the entire enrollment down process down to five minutes. Um, well, about four weeks ago, we launched the latest version of our onboarding process, and we've got the entire process now down to as little as two minutes. So in two minutes, you can now open um, what we think is probably one of the best checking accounts in the country. You know, uh, it pays actually a high yield for a checking account. It has no fees, no minimums, um, free ATM access anywhere in the world, regardless of network, free wire transfers, both domestic and international. Um, as well as four or five high yield savings accounts, uh, you know, some of which better deliver better than the best yield in the market. And this entire setup can now be done in two minutes. So we're really proud of the team and how hard everyone has worked to try to take every friction. And with a two minute setup, you really have no excuse, right? You could be earning more in the time it takes to wait for a commercial break to be over. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the big frictions and uh, the key is really overcoming the friction. So awareness, Apathy and inertia are, are really our, our three big competitors. So I think that's a, I, I like that, I like that framework because that, that, that truly is what you're competing against, right? And so in terms of, terms of um, uh, alternatives, even if they don't you know, provide the same level of service that you do, but I, certainly you will come up against them. So one alternative is CDs. Um, and you said something, you said something you know, before we got on the air that was pretty interesting is that that, that your product, how your product measures up against CDs, which obviously have some liquidity and other types of trade-offs. And tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure, Ramsey. You know, it's interesting, over the entire history of Max, we have always outperformed CDs. And that's pretty much any CD. And it's a little counterintuitive because generally the, the, the trade-off with a CD is you're giving up liquidity in exchange for higher yield, right? And a lot of investors, if they think about their total cash position, they might say, well, gee, some of this I might need in the next year, so I'm going to keep that liquid, or I might need it in the next three months. Other cash I hold as sort of a security blanket, but I really don't expect to need it over the next year, so I'll put that in a CD and I'll earn higher yield. Um, and generally, within any individual bank, um, that sort of you know liquidity return trade-off holds true. But what we've been able to do with Max is take so much cost out of the banking system that banks on the Max platform are able to deliver higher yield through Max than they would on a regular CD. Um, and the reason is twofold. First is that when you move from brick and mortar to online, you take a lot of cost out of the banking system. This is really the same as what we went through in the retail industry, right? When Bezos started Amazon.com, uh, I think it was called Amazonbooks.com, 
about 22 years ago, he had a really simple idea, which is a textbook is a commodity. And if I can sell that commodity online rather than in a brick and mortar store, I'll have a lower cost structure. And so I can sell that textbook for a lower price and over time I'll gain share. And that's exactly what he did. That was sort of Amazon 1.0. And the online banks look a lot like Amazon 1.0. They tend to be single product companies. They say, my single product is an FDIC insured savings account. I don't have brick and mortar costs. Therefore, I can deliver a higher interest rate. And we're seeing customers start to migrate to um, online banks, not necessarily replacing their existing bank relationship, but they might say, I'm a Chase customer. I'm going to supplement my Chase account with a savings account at American Express or Ally or Barclays. And that makes a lot of sense, right? You're in a sense kind of cherry picking. You're saying, I want all the benefits of my existing brick and mortar bank relationship, but I also want the higher yield that the online banks uh, can deliver. And people did the exact same thing in the retail industry, right? They would go to Toys R Us, which doesn't exist anymore, but um, they would go to Toys R Us, they would sort of browse the full selection, they'd pick out the item they want, and then they'd pull out their phone and order it on Amazon, right? Same kind of cherry picking. Um, so that was sort of the origin. Um, and the online banks historically have been able to pay up to 100 basis points more uh, than brick and mortar banks um, because of that cost differential. But what we found with the Max platform is that online banks were still spending a lot of money on customer acquisition. And we said, well, gosh, that's just another tax on the system. Why are you spending money on advertising and spending money on click-throughs and referral fees when we can deliver better quality customers to these banks without them having to spend on marketing? And so we built something called the Max Common Application. Um, and for anyone listening who has kids who are applying to college or have applied to college, uh, they'll appreciate the difference between um, what it's like today versus what it was like when, when we were all oh, applying yes. to college. When we applied to college, you had to fill out multiple forms and paperwork, um, which you know feels a lot like opening bank accounts. Today, a student goes online, they fill out a single application, they you know check the names of the schools to which they'd like to apply, and all the data is sort of parsed and sent to the individual schools. We built the same thing for opening bank accounts. So on our platform, the client fills out a single form, or in fact, the advisor can pre-fill the form for them, or with our, our integration with Redtail, the advisor can just click a button in their CRM and all the data will be pre-filled. So we made it really simple. Um, and then the client just you know clicks on the logos of the banks where they'd like to open new accounts. And 60 seconds later, now they have three or four new high yield online savings accounts. So by stripping out customer acquisition costs for the banks, the bank said, well, wait a minute, we could afford to pay max customers an even higher yield than we pay to the general public. And historically, the highest yield on the max platform has been somewhere between 10 and 30 basis points higher than the highest yielding nationally advertised online banks. So with that incremental premium, you can beat the yield even on a CD from an online bank. Um, and over time, because the Max platform is also always looking for the best rate, you're not locked into a single bank. So you might start out at bank A, and then three months later, we might find that bank B is offering a higher rate, and we'll help you move your money from bank A to bank B. And then you know a month later, bank C is offering a higher rate, and your money can move again. And so you're sort of actively, with Max, you're actively managing your cash um, in search of the best yield all the time while keeping it all FDIC insured as well. So, all right, so two questions. One is how frequent are the rebalances? And then, you know, all that rebalancing, I, you know, I see statements and 1099s. How do you, how do you make that, those two processes efficient? So we've given the, the, the user a lot of control here. So by default, the rebalancing will happen once per month. Um, but you can go in and change the settings. You can say, look, I'm preparing to close on purchase of a house right now, don't do anything for the next 90 days. Um, you can tell the system that you only want to rebalance whenever you, you know, explicitly click a button, uh, or you can sort of set it um, to, to occur every month. Um, so that process is, is really simple. And then in terms of, of statements and, and 1099s, uh, what we built was a feature called consolidated tax reporting. So come tax time, you click on one button on the website and Max automatically gathers your 1099s for all of the banks where you hold accounts, puts it into a single PDF, password protects it for you, and sends it to you by email. So you could just forward that email to your accountant and you're done. 
Um, and that's, it's interesting, that was not the hardest feature to build, but it's one of the most loved features because no one likes doing taxes and anything that makes taxes simpler makes people happy. Yeah, I, I, I love your model, uh, awareness, apathy, and inertia. On, on the awareness front, um, I guess if you, you, you kind of went, th go go the, every one of those three gates, uh, does it always take a person, an advisor, an agent, um, a trusted confidant to make people take people down the journey? How much of this can you do by yourself? So you can do all of it by yourself. It, it's a very simple enrollment process now, but we think that the human advisor is incredibly important. Um, and it's interesting. In the past, we've had robo advisors come to us and say, "You know, would you power our platform?" And some of those robo advisors are very anti advisor. Um, and we've said, "No, we we really don't want to partner with someone who's anti advisor because we think for the vast majority of clients, they are better off with that human element." Um, it's really important. A lot of people feel very intimidated by financial topics, right? The same is true with annuities. They're complex and people don't understand them and they really need an advisor to help hold their hand and understand their particular situation and help them pick the product that's best for them. Um, so, um, well, you can come to MaxMyInterest.com and, and sign up. Um, we have a separate site, MaxForAdvisors.com, uh, where financial advisors can learn about uh, the solution and register for a free Max Advisor dashboard account, which in turn enables them to invite clients and gain visibility over those balances. Um, and we find that the majority of our clients come to us through advisors. You know, money is, is a really interesting thing, right? I mean, it's, it's a real relationship of trust. And we found that in general, it's better for advisors to come to us. We spend time with them. They get to know us. They study us. They put us through due diligence. And then they feel comfortable and then they can go to their clients and the clients then rely on the advisors and all of the diligence they've done rather than each individual customer having to go conduct their own due diligence. And it turns out that the diligence in this case is really simple because Max My Interest never touches any money. It's not a custodian. Uh, you never send any money to Max. Um, Max is really more like an air traffic control tower just looking out over your own bank accounts. and um, you know, telling your banks whenever you want to move money from one account to another and making that really simple and streamlined. But at its core, Max is really just a communications platform. So when we go through diligence at wealth management firms, it's really interesting because they first send us to investment committee. An investment committee studies it and they says, well, you know, this makes all the sense in the world, but it's really not even an investment. It's just cash. And so then they send us to, you know, the, the tech committee because they said, look, this is really just technology. And we spend time with the tech committee and they look at it and they say, this is great, but this actually doesn't even touch our systems in any way. So it doesn't require any technology blessing either. Um, and that's typically the, the diligence path that we go through um, with, uh, with wealth management firms. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, there's a lot of friction um, in financial services and advisors are, are really best positioned to help hold clients' hands and, and help them through these important decisions. Yeah, I think so. So I was going to just say that you know, the, you earlier on you talked about broker dealers, and uh, they can insert themselves in many ways. Sometimes it's a warehouse, sometimes it's an independent broker dealer, sometimes the uh, it is the the custodian behind a you know behind behind an RIA, right? And as we all know, like um, the big custodians, one of the ways they broker does one of the ways they make money these days is actually through holding of balances as opposed to as opposed to commissions. So even though they're not doing things as, as well as you do or in the same way as you do, you know, I imagine that 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 they want to keep those balances. So I'm just wondering if you've you know, how you've dealt with it, how you've run into how, how you communicate with them, against them, vis a vis RAs, what what is the what does the competitive framework look like there? That's a great question, Ramsey, because you're right. I mean, for the custodians, for some of them, they actually make the majority of their profit based on the spread they earn on idle client cash. Um, the good news for the custodians is that when you look at a client's total cash picture, they keep some amount of cash in the brokerage account for trading and liquidity, um, but the preponderance of their cash is actually held away, right? It's at Wells Fargo, it's at Fifth Third yeah. Bank, it's at TD Bank. Um, and so, um, 
when advisors start using Max with their clients, it really doesn't impact uh, the cash that's held in the custodial account because you know if, if I as an advisor have decided that I want 3% cash for liquidity and trading and payment of quarterly fees and that sort of thing, that's, that's going to stay constant. Um, the, the cash that is, that is uh, optimized or, or earning more through Max is typically the held away cash that's now being brought into view. And from that perspective, it's actually an AUM growth tool for the custodial platform. So it's a little counterintuitive because the initial reaction is, well, aren't you going to cannibalize my deposits? But when you actually look at the data, um, Max is not cannibalizing the custodial deposits at all. It's actually discovering new assets. And for several years, uh, Schwab has been giving us a booth at, at Schwab Impact because they appreciated that this is not a threat. This is actually complementary. Um, and you know, not surprisingly, a lot of the advisors that work with Max are, are custodying at Schwab or Fidelity or um, in some cases Pershing or other places. Um, but it, it's it's really complimentary. It's not a threat. Well, this is terrific. Well, let me ask you a macro question. So I, I read that the, the, the Fed has sort of indicated that interest r rates will rise. They're holding them. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the last uh, piece of news I said Rudd suggested that rates would slowly go up uh, in response to inflation. I guess, uh, what's your perspective on rates, and how should that change how advisors or, or clients think about their 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 short-term cash holdings? Well, uh, rates are, are really interesting, and, and um, I, I'm not a perfect prognosticator of rates, although I do think that they will rise sooner than the Fed has indicated. I, I thought that um, last spring, and I thought that in the fall, and I still think that today, and that they're sort of sl slowly walking the line. They don't want to move the curve too much too quickly. Um, but I do think we're going to see uh, banks increase their rates um, considerably sooner than uh, the Fed uh, current timeline. Um, but the dynamic of the market is really interesting because we're in this environment where simultaneously rates are nominally low, right? Even at 60 basis points, it's kind of hard to get too excited about it. But on a relative basis, the yields that Max is delivering are much greater than any other option out there, right? Uh, typical, um, you know, checking accounts tend to pay zero. Savings accounts on average across the country today pay six basis points. Money market funds are paying about two basis points. Brokerage, uh, you know, broker deposits paying eight basis points. And we're at 60. So there's a very big delta there. And wherever you see 50 plus basis points of incremental risk-free return, you should chase that. Um, that's real money. It compounds over time, particularly with clients with larger balances. And the typical client using Max is sort of a few hundred thousand to a few million in cash. So at those balances, an extra 50 basis points compounded makes a difference. Um, and we've even had advisors say that now that they've started using Max, uh, it's actually made their fee conversations with clients easier. Um, one told me that he was uh, about to raise his fee from a client uh, I think his, his, he was charging $10,000 a year in fees to the client, and he was going to up that to $20,000 a year, which is a fairly substantial difference. And at the time, the client said, yeah, but you made me an extra $20,000 a year just by introducing me to Max, so that's fine. right? You're demonstrating your value. You're, you're creating alpha. Um, and most of what an advisor does is, is help optimize beta. So whenever you can find alpha, that's a good thing. Um, so... Um, you know, I, I think part of what's driving rates and what's driven rates so low is that there's a big um, there's a big mismatch in liquidity in financial markets today. And if you look at the banks, they've been absolutely flooded with deposits. Um, now, whenever the government prints another trillion dollars every month, uh, or, or so it seems, that money has to go somewhere. Um, and in this case, a lot of it is flooded into banks at precisely the same time that banks have had fewer good lending opportunities because during the pandemic um, people were not building new movie theaters or malls or um, investing in new restaurants or other things and so at the same time that deposits went up lending activity went down um, and that mismatch led banks to say we've got to get rid of excess deposits and we'll just drop the rate and hope that those deposits go away. And what a lot of banks found was that they could keep dropping the rate all the way down to zero and the deposit still wouldn't go away. Um, and so part of what we do with our software as well is enable banks 
to uh, be more intelligent about rate setting and optimize uh, their balance sheets as well. And sometimes in some environments that means growing their balance sheet and in other environments it means helping them precisely shrink their balance sheet. Um, but uh, I think you know we're going to continue to see historically low rates for a while, um, but I don't think we're going to have to wait until 2023 before uh, rate hikes. I think you're going to see bank interest rates start going up sooner. And, and I say that because a lot of the banks that we speak with six months ago, all they could think about was how do I get cash off, off of my balance sheet? And now what they're thinking about is this market for deposits is going to become more competitive. How do I make sure I've positioned myself so that six months from now when I need more deposits and loan growth has gone up, I'm able to get the deposits that I need. Um, and that's really important for a bank because a bank is really about two things, managing risk, right? Making sure that you write good loans and, and price them properly and managing balance sheet. And if you can't manage your balance sheet properly, if you have uh, more deposits than loans, then you're less profitable. If you have more loans than deposits, then you're out of business. <laughs> and so getting that balance sheet management right is really important. Um, and what we inadvertently built in Max in addition to this great solution for for individual investors and this great solution for advisors is also a great solution for banks in helping them manage liquidity. Oh, this is this was great. Ramsey, what do you think? What So, uh, you know, I'm a fan. I've been a fan for a while and uh, you know, I I I I like a number of things about it. I like the fact that it's a product that, you know, as as Gary just pointed out, that that does something good for all the various stakeholders, right? So the individual, the advisory inter intermediary, and then sort of the, the provider of the balance sheet. Like all three of them, you know, have a, have, a, have, a, have a clear benefit here. And it's also interesting that like would-be competitors, would-be competitors benefit from this other element, which is visibility, right? So your journey, Gary, started out with visibility way back in the beginning because you, were tr you wanted to see where your money was. And then we found out that it was helpful for advisors to see where the money is. And it's also helpful for the uh, for the uh, for the again for the providers of balance sheet for the deposit deposit holders uh, to 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 have visibility on when and where they can bring in deposits. So, uh, really an amazing product. And uh, but thanks for joining us today. Well, Ramsey and Paul, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. No, thank you, and Gary. Um, MaxMyInterest.com. I think that's the URL you'd want people to go to to learn more. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And for advisors, there's a tab on that page that they can click on that says financial advisors right at the top, and they can learn more uh, there as well. Oh, yeah, this, this is great. Listen, uh, Gary, thanks so much for your time. Um, fascinating topic. I mean, one I'm personally pa very passionate about and uh, hope all our, our listeners did as well. And uh, if you are listening, please, if you want to stay in touch with Gary and any of uh, the other guests on our show, go to our website, uh, subscribe to our newsletter. And uh, right now we're sending out a newsletter about once every two weeks. So we're not going to flood your, your uh, inbox, but uh, we're going to keep updates uh, from, from you know, people like Gary and uh, let you stay in touch and uh, get the latest news. So thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. And join us again next week for another episode of That Annuity Show. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information at thatannuityshow.com.